please be seated. The court is now in session. Today, the chamber continues to hear testimony of uh, expert. Is Mr. Morris. Mr. M. Hoy, please report the attendance of the parties and other individuals to today's proceedings. Mr. President, for today's proceedings, all parties to this case are present. Mr. Nunchi is present in the holding cell downstairs. He has waived his right to be present in the courtroom. The waiver has been delivered to the Grafie. The expert who is to continue his testimony today, that is Mr. Sven Morris, is present in the courtroom. Thank you. President, thank you. And the Chamber now decides on the request by Nun Chi. The Chamber has received a waiver from Nun Chi dated 19 October 2016, which states that due to his health, that is, headache, back pain, he cannot sit or concentrate for long, and in order to effectively participate in future hearings, he requests to waive his right to be present at the 19 October 2016 hearing. Having seen the medical report of Nguyen Chi by the duty doctor for the accused at the ECCC, dated 19 October 2016, which notes that today Nguyen Chi has back pain and a chronic back pain when he sits for long and recommends that the chambers all grant him his request so that he can follow the proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs. Based on the above information and pursuant to Rule 815 of the EECCC internal rules, the chamber grants Nunji his request to follow today's proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs by and audiovisual means. The Chamber instructs the AV unit personnel to link the proceedings to the room downstairs so that Nguyen Chi can follow that applies for the whole day. I now hand the floor again to counsel for uh, Nguyen Chi, that is Counsel Copper, to put further question to the expert. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, Counsel. Good morning, uh, Mr. Morris. Um, before I move to my next subject, um, there is one follow-up question um, in relation to your testimony uh, yesterday that I would like to ask you. Um, we, we have a, a draft transcript um, from yesterday's proceedings, and uh, in relation to a question from me about um, uh, late King Father Sihanouk, uh, you said at around uh, 15.25 um, in the afternoon um, and a bit further uh, around 15.28 uh, the following and, and let me read it back to you. Uh, you said um, and I think that he, the King Father Sihanouk, was somebody who acted very rationally and with very careful judgment about, what's, what, about what was in the best interest of Cambodian independence. And then you say, uh, but the late King Father made it very clear that Cambodia had to live with Vietnam, that it had to accept his reality, the existence of Vietnam to the east, uh, and not to try to pursue policies that might encourage a more aggressive Vietnamese policy. I think he I think that's been his consistent position. This is what you said uh, yesterday. Um, now, um, I briefly mentioned um, Prince Sihanouk's speech um, on the 11th of January before the Security Council um, of the United Nations. Um, I will not quote his full speech, but um, the few things that he said, for instance, there's document E3-7335, um, 
English ERN 01001643. And Mr. President, um, all paragraphs of his speech are the same uh, in French and Khmer. So I will be referring to uh, the paragraphs of uh, that UN document. Um, for instance, in paragraph 75, um, he compares um, uh, Vietnam and uh, Cambodia to um, uh, a boa constrictor. Let, 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 me, let me read it fully. Um, but on the very morrow of the final victory in April 75, a victory over imperialism, and in the wake of the reunification of the two Vietnams, North and South, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam decided, cold-bloodedly, to embark upon a very special operation whose ultimate goal was nothing less than to swallow up little Kampuchea just as a starving boa constrictor would fling itself upon uh, an innocent animal. Um, further on, in paragraph 79, he compares the invasion with uh, Hitler's attack Nazi Germany's attack uh, of Poland in 1939, uh, and he strongly condemns the aggression. Now, having said that, uh, three days earlier, um, he gave a press conference um, in Beijing. Are you aware of the things he said during that press conference uh, to the international press? Uh, no, I do not recall what he said at that time. Um, there he actually uh, answered questions as to um, uh, the policy of DK and whether um, um, DK's position and reaction toward Vietnam um, was appropriate. He said, um, let me first ask, is it, is it correct to say that China in 1979 and before was one of the uh, protectors or, or patrons of CNUC that they were very well, uh, um, had very warm and cordial relations with uh, Prince Sihanouk. Would that be correct to say? Yes, that would be correct. So, so this is what he said uh, among other things. Um, Sorry, just a reference. Yes. Um, I, I just uh, talked with the um, uh, legal officer. There is no E3 number yet. Uh, we sent an email this morning. You have admitted this document um, last week. Uh, it's now English ERN 01323954. And um, provisionally, it's called E. 435.1.8. He said the following, you have a very clear, very ominous example of naked aggression from one country against another without any justification. They cannot turn Kampuchea into a colony of Vietnam. Uh, Vietnamese are a satellite state of Russia. How can you be sure that the Vietnamese and Russians will be satisfied with the swallowing of Kampuchea? As the French saying goes, the more one eats, the better one's appetite. After swallowing Kampuchea, the appetite of the Russians, the Warsaw Pact, and the Vietnamese will grow. They will threaten Thailand. And after swallowing Thailand, they will swallow Singapore and Malaysia, as this is in the interest of Vietnamese imperialism and colonialism. And then he says, and that's important, um, when he talks about Pol Pot, he said, um, I do not agree with his internal policy, uh, but his external policy is good because Pol Pot is a patriot. His determination to defend the territorial integrity, national dignity, and national independence is good. Um, long excerpts, but um, 
would you agree with me that there is really no difference in CNUC's position before the invasion and any, no difference between his position and the DK's position in terms of Vietnamese aggression and the Vietnamese invasion? Uh, it would appear so on the basis of that statement. Uh, however, I would say that um, uh, there was a common interest in repelling the Vietnamese invasion at that time, and so uh, I would su su suggest that um, differences that existed may have been uh, papered over because of the common interest. Um. I would like to follow up on that, but I, I will not because of time. Uh, let me move now to my, uh, my next subject, uh, Mr. Morris. Uh, and that is something that uh, we could also debate um, maybe for the whole day, but we have to be very short on this. And that's um, um, Vietnam's or the, uh, the Communist Party of Vietnam's ideology and its position uh, toward the Soviet Union. Um, because of time's sake, I would like to move immediately to um, um, the period of temporal jurisdiction of, of the court. Um, you have quoted in your book uh, Trung Nong uh, Nhu Tan, who said that there was a clear victory for the pro-Soviet uh, faction already uh, in uh, 1974. However, you also mention in your book um, the fourth uh, Congress of the Vietnamese Workers' Party, then becoming the Vietnamese Com Communist Party in 1976. Um, could you describe Vietnam's position um, toward the Soviet Union after um, the fourth Congress in December 1976? Please uh, observe the microphone. Uh, I would say that the uh, Vietnamese position was uh, that the Soviet Union had the correct line in the international communist movement and uh, that Vietnam felt that it was correct to follow the Soviet position. And <clears throat> moreover, uh, it felt that the Soviet Union was a supporter and protector of Vietnamese interests vis-a-vis -vis China, um, and that uh, therefore uh, it was right and uh, necessary for Vietnam to follow the Soviet line on international affairs uh, and further develop its relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, thank you, that's, that's clear. Um, would you agree with um, uh, President Carter's um, national security advisor at the time, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, who called Vietnam, um, as, as related in Nayan Chanda, uh, a Soviet surrogate or a Soviet proxy? Mr. Expert, please hold on. And the political lawyer for civil parties, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just um, a request uh, at the beginning of this hearing. Our references, our colleagues should systematically give us the ERNs of uh, Mr. Morris's book or of the other sources he is referring to. This would allow everyone to follow. He goes quite quickly when he mentions sources, so if you could please remind him to mention the ERN or the page in Mr. Morris's book or the other sources he is referring to when he is uh, questioning the expert. Thank you, and Council uh, Copper, please adhere to the priorities. Uh, the request is appropriate for this regard. Uh, no problem, Mr. Mr. President. Um, 
Brzezinski says, uh, Chanda refers to what uh, Brzezinski says um, on English ERN um, 00192449, which is um, French ERN 00237119 and Khmer 00196099. And Brzezinski says um, the same on uh, 0019-2472 in English. Um, and in command 0019-1634-35 and French 0023-7136. Um, so, um, Mr. Expert, would you agree with um, uh, the way Brzezinski describes Vietnam being a Soviet surrogate or a Soviet proxy? I would say that this was a little bit uh, overstated by um, Dr. Brzezinski. Um, you must recall that uh, he was holding office in the Carter administration at that time, and uh, his judgments were in part reflection of the political situation and America's position at that time. My view is that uh, the Vietnamese were making their own policy uh, towards Cambodia and uh, China, and that the Soviet Union was supporting Vietnam um, and uh, therefore uh, I would look at the initiative as being primarily Vietnamese in what they were doing with regard to Cambodia and China rather than the initiative being the Soviet. But nevertheless, the Soviets supported Vietnam. Um, let me move on quickly, but, uh, although I have some other questions by, which I might uh, reserve for later. Um, there is one particular uh, key moment in um, communist history which um, is extremely important, which you say yourself as well, uh, and that is um, the uh, uh, Soviet invasion in uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968. Uh, in your book, um, 01001817, um, you called uh, the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia, a, quote, landmark event in international relations and particularly in international communist relations. Uh, could you explain to the chamber why that is? Uh, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia was a landmark event in international relations and international communist relations because it made clear that the Soviet Union would not tolerate uh, a domestic uh, policy uh, reorienting itself away from the Soviet model uh, and uh, potentially reorienting itself away from the Soviet bloc. Can you describe what Vietnam's I think consistent position has been on uh, the Soviet invasion in 68? The Vietnamese supported the Soviet position on Czechoslovakia in 1968, uh, including the rationale of the Soviet invasion. Um, the reason I'm discussing Czechoslovakia uh, is uh, twofold. Uh, one, because in internal DK policies, uh, especially by Son Sen, Czechoslovakia is um, a, a very important consideration. I will get back to that. Um, but let me concentrate first now on something uh, Nayan Chanda has said uh, in his book. Uh, that is uh, 0019 um, uh, 
and um, in English, uh, in French here, and that's 00237080, and Khmer 01, 00191580. And let me read it to you. Um, in late 1978, I'm sorry, I don't think we got the English. I didn't hear it. Yes, I, I just mentioned it. It's 00192401. It's page 216 of his book. Uh, so this is what Chanda writes. Um, in late January 1978, General uh, Grigorievich Pavlovsky, Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Ground Forces, arrived in neighboring Laos in his special Aeroflot jetliner for a friendly visit. Vietnamese Minister of Defense, General uh, Vo Nhien Yap, flew to uh, Vieng Sai in northern Laos for an unpublicized meeting with the Soviet general to review the Cambodian situation. Pavlovsky advice, a Vietnamese official told me years later, was do a Czechoslovakia. Um, it goes on to uh, uh, describing Yap's reaction. But um, Soviet advice to Vietnamese um, uh, Communist Party leaders um, do a Czechoslovakia. Was that something that you found as well, uh, or did you find evidence in the Soviet archives confirming this Soviet advice to Vietnam? Uh, no, it's not uh, something that I found evidence of in the Soviet archives, which uh, doesn't mean it wasn't uh, the case. Uh, it's just that the documents that I had access to uh, did not re uh, reveal such advice. Um, thank you for that answer. But is it correct that in your book, um, 01001773, uh, you quote um, Theran Quyen, uh, who, according to you, was a member of the Central Committee of the Vietnamese Communist Party. Um, that he said, and you, you, in your book you write, he contrasted Cambodia in 1978 with Czechoslovakia in 1968. In Czechoslovakia, counter-revolutionaries had overthrown the revolutionary power and that is why uh, bringing in outside forces was necessary. Um, this is a quote from um, this Kuyen in 78. Does that quote somehow conf could confirm Russian advice uh, to do a Czechoslovakia in um, Cambodia? Um, I do recall that uh, quote. I'm not quite sure the implications of it. Uh, I think it was uh, needed to be um, fleshed out a little bit more, the argument that he was trying to make. Um, fair enough. Um, one very last question on Vietnamese ideology, and then I move on to my next subject. Uh, in your book, uh, 01001795, um, you say that the Vietnamese have consistently uh, defended Stalin all the way up until 1979. Uh, is that true? And, and can you explain why that was? Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, and as to why it was is an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I think that the um, Vietnamese communists celebrated the communist international, uh, the Comintern, um, as a great period in the history of the communist movements. And Stalin was the head of 
not the official head of the Comintern, but it, the de facto leader of the Comintern during most of its life. Um, it was the Comintern which created the Vietnamese Communist Party, and it was Stalin who um, more or less was the, 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 the most revered leader of uh, international communism at the time in which the Vietnamese Communist Party, it later renamed the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, was formed. I think that um, the, the, the Vietnamese communists believed that uh, Stalin had created a unified international communist movement uh, and that he did not tolerate uh, divergency, uh, he did not tolerate um, independence, and um, therefore uh, he was a model uh, for the development of the communist movement in the time subsequent to his death. Um, the Vietnamese were very unhappy with what we used to call polycentrism in the communist world. The Vietnamese were unhappy with different centers of power in the communist world. And uh, they wanted to see, as Ho Chi Minh said uh, just before he died, that uh, the, the reunification of all the communist parties uh, is one of my most cherished hopes. What, one one follow-up. Um, isn't it correct that even in 1979, after they had invaded uh, Cambodia, um, celebrating, I believe, the 100th birthday of Stalin, they still um, argued that Stalin's policies were correct? Yes, they still argued that Stalin's policies were correct. And as far as I'm aware, that continued into the 1980s. And is it then also correct to say that there was no necessity to do so because I believe Hungarians or Czechs took a totally different position on Stalin, even the Soviets themselves? Yes, that is correct. Um, there was no political necessity in terms of the national interests of Vietnam or the, of the, Viet, the, the security uh, interests of the Vietnamese Communist Party to be celebrating Stalin, Stalinism, and the international communist movement under Stalin. Uh, I think uh, the celebration of Stalin and the international communist movement reflects the true ideological beliefs of the Vietnamese communist leadership. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Morris. Let me move on to my next subject. Um, we briefly touched upon it yesterday um, about um, uh, when we were talking about the, the Vietnamese uh, perspective of, of Khmer. Um, you uh, also in your book uh, on 0100-1692, you talked about the uh, quote-unquote cultural arrogance of the Vietnamese uh, and uh, quote-unquote profound contempt for the culture uh, of Cambodia and the Vietnamese being highly patronizing uh, toward the Cambodians. Um, what's interesting is that um, in Chanda and, and uh, Philip Short, for instance, we, we see the, the same things. Um, but let me move away from the, the cultural arrogance and, and the contempt for the culture of Cambodia to other, um, um, well, quote unquote, characteristics of um, Vietnamese leaders. I'm not interested in what the average Vietnamese person would say, but I'm interested in what um, uh, Le Duan or Le Zuen and, and Le Duc Tho and others would, would think. Words that I have, um, written down, reading Chanda and Short and others uh, are the following words. Uh, so they're not mine, just to be sure. Um, calling um, the Vietnamese in their foreign policy um, arrogant, deceitful, 
condescending, untrustworthy. And I'm particularly interested in the words deceitful and untrustworthy. Um, you have seen in the Soviet archives, if I understand correctly, um, Soviet Union complaints, um, diplomats in Hanoi complaints about um, deceitful behavior of the Vietnamese in, I believe, 1972. C can you um, expand a bit on this, on this, please? And while he is waiting, since you yourself said you're quoting somebody, please tell her, give us the references. Um, certainly. Um, the expert is um, talking about um, untrustworthy Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese on 01001876 and 01001878. Chanda uh, is talking, I, I'll just give the English here, and uh, on 0019 uh, 2588 about uh, Americans being suspicious about the quote unquote tricky Vietnamese. Um, um, the other quotes on how, how patronizing I just mentioned. Um, I believe the, uh, the expert in his book refers to uh, on page 0100. 1720 to um, uh, Henry Kissinger noticing the condescending cynical attitude of Le Duc Tho, um, and also Short uh, goes on about this but let me refer basically to that's what I'm interested in um, Mr. Expert as to what the Soviets uh, meant when they called the Vietnamese deceitful Uh, when the Soviets referred to the Vietnamese as deceitful, they were referring to the fact that the Vietnamese did not share their strategic plans with the Soviet Union, that they accepted Soviet assistance <coughs> willingly, gladly, uh, but did not reveal always what that assistance was going to be used for precisely. And uh, the, one of these statements came in the context of the planning of the what was called the Easter Offensive in Vietnam in 1972 <clears throat> when the Soviet Union or at least when Vietnam was planning the biggest offensive of the Vietnam War against South Vietnam backed by the United States. Uh, a major uh, Soviet delegation came to Hanoi uh, to negotiate further Soviet aid uh, and yet uh, the Vietnamese did not reveal that their initiation of the Easter Offensive was imminent. Uh, this uh, upset the Soviets and uh, the ambassador, uh, I believe, talks about this. That is, the Soviet ambassador to North Vietnam talks about this in his annual report. Um, uh, but uh, there, are, there are other instances where the um, Vietnamese, uh, the, the Soviets complained about the Vietnamese not being exactly uh, open about their, uh, about their intentions. Um, thank you. And, and following up on this, uh, it's not a citation from you, but it's from Chanda, as I just um, mentioned. Do you, are you in a position to tell us why uh, the Americans um, presumably related, uh, referring to the uh, Paris 73 negotiations, um, considered the Vietnamese to be tricky. President, please hold on. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the Americans were upset that the Vietnamese would often um, make public statements and uh, take political initiatives in front of the press uh, at a time without, without forewarning the United States. 
uh, to try and create some kind of uh, fait accompli in negotiations, uh, to reveal some uh, secret discussions. Um, and uh, therefore, the Americans were upset that um, the, um, that the Vietnamese communists would not follow the normal agreed rules of the game in negotiations, secret negotiations. Um, following up on this, um, of course, what's also very interesting is uh, the Chinese perspective um, on the Vietnamese. Yesterday, I mentioned briefly um, Deng Xiaoping. Um, could you explain the chamber uh, what kind of um, Chinese leader uh, Deng Xiaoping was? How, how should we view Deng Xiaoping in terms of foreign policy? I think Deng Xiaoping was a, a Chinese uh, nationalist uh, and a, a pragmatist. Uh, uh, who wanted to reorient Chinese foreign policy uh, in a way that would guarantee Chinese security against what was perceived as a Soviet threat to China, a Soviet threat of encirclement of China, uh, uh, partly through Vietnam, uh, and the creation of bases, of course, in Vietnam, which would be considered a security threat to China. Uh, I think that um, at this time, uh, Deng Xiaoping was um, very open to uh, new alliances, uh, new relationships in international politics, uh, which is why he forged a closer relationship with the United States in the late 1970s. Um, is it correct that um, in doing your research in the Soviet archives, you uh, found a very positive characterization of Deng Xiaoping by uh, Le Zuen, Le Duan. Yes, I, I, sorry, to be quite honest, I've, uh, it's, it's just a, v a vague memory of, the, of that part of the uh, research. I, I, I will find the exact um, uh, quote for you. Um, why I, I I refer to this is, um, on the one hand, um, Vietnam, Vietnam, or at least uh, Le Zuen or Le Duan, had a very positive um, idea of the pragmatist Deng Xiaoping. On the other hand, um, I would like to read to you an excerpt from uh, Chanda on Deng Xiaoping and Deng Xiaoping's position towards the Vietnamese. Um, Mr. President, that is, um, Chanda's book E3 slash 2376, English ERN 00192446, French 00237116, and uh, Khmer 00191604. And this, this is what Chanda, uh, I find very inter interestingly, describes. Um, quote. Ironically, the man who seemed to hate the Vietnamese most passionately was Deng Xiaoping, whose re-emergence had been welcomed by the Vietnamese. A Thai diplomat uh, says uh, the moment the topic of Vietnam uh, would come up, one could see something change in Deng Xiaoping. His hatred for the Vietnamese was visceral. He spat forcefully into his spittoon and called the Vietnamese dogs. The Vietnamese, Deng, Chau, Deng announced at a press conference in November 78, were the hooligans of the East. End of quote. Um, could you give a reaction to what this Thai diplomat describes? Are you asking me uh, my reaction to the description of Deng Xiaoping? Well, let, let, me, let me be more concrete. Um, was this visceral hate of the Vietnamese 
something only for De Deng Xiaoping, or was this shared among members of the Politburo or Central Committee um, uh, within the Chinese Communist Party? Is that something that you know? I think the Chinese leadership in general was very, very angry with the Vietnamese because of the fact that China had provided an enormous amount of assistance to the Vietnamese Communist Party in its quest to uh, take control of South Vietnam, uh, and that um, this ingratitude uh, probably was pervasive in the Chinese leadership, the, or at least, sorry, the, the, this perception of Vietnamese ingratitude towards China was pervasive amongst the Chinese leadership. I think Deng Xiaoping was merely reflecting what most Chinese leaders would have felt, um, particularly because um, Vietnam could have maintained a neutral position between the Soviet Union and China and instead chose to uh, orient itself towards the Soviet Union, which was China's principal security threat at that time. So uh, I would say that uh, the Chinese reaction was understandable. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Morris. I will move on to my uh, next subject, arguably um, the most important subject. Um, and that is the question um, whether uh, the imperial ambitions that we spoke about yesterday and the desire to create an Indo-Chinese federation, um, whether these ambitions were in fact implemented at one point in time, and if yes, um, uh, how they were uh, implemented. Um, I'll be asking you questions uh, in relation to a broader period than the temporal jurisdiction, um, the period between 1970 and 1979. Um, Having read um, your book, Enchanda, and I will come with exact quotes uh, later, um, I have um, been able, I think, to distinguish eight methods of um, implementation of um, this policy, if it existed. I have written down as, um, coming from you, uh, establishing political control influence over the Cambodian insurgency, uh, controlling the Cambodian revolution, that's one. Two, um, methods such as subversion, sabotage, espionage, and infiltration uh, in Cambodia. Um, another one is um, continuous encroachments into Cambodian territory presumably also provoking DK forces. Um, for removing, please let me finish. Uh, I will get back to it, point by point. Removing uh, Pol Pot from power through assassination attempts. Um, starting a civil war, building up guerrilla forces uh, or a clandestine war. Most importantly, staging uh, coup d'etats and finally, a military invasion, Czechoslovakian style. These are eight methods that I've found, and I will discuss a few, uh, and I will be referring to uh, exact quotes. President, please hold on. Mr. Expert, and the floor is given to the lead call lawyer for civil party. Thank you, Mr. President. I think there's a problem in the method. Our colleague had found a method in Morris's work. Why is he not systematically citing the passages that he's referring to so that this expert can say whether he agrees or not, rather than presenting some general conclusions which are an interpretation of 
what the expert said. I don't know why our colleague cannot point by point cite his sources. That's the goal of having an expert in this chamber to benefit of the expertise of the expert and not of the knowledge and pleadings of our colleague. I actually said that I will do that uh, after first having read out um, all methods to get the general picture. I will move now to his exact quotes, no worry. But generally, counsel, she's right. When you first mention it, you, give the, you give the reference. That's how we have done it in the court all the time. We trust you'll do it now. But after two years in the trial. Don't be so fetishist on little rules, Judge Fenz. This is not fetishism. <laughs> this is allowing the other parties to follow the trial. There's, a, there's a, a, a reason behind these rules. I presume you have read his book. All parties have read his books. And I'm now going to go to the exact quotes. No worry. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Morris, um, I'm sure you don't understand what's going on. Let me first um, go to the things that you have said in your book, um, 01001721. You said um, the Vietnamese communists began with two political instruments for establishing their political control over the Cambodian insurgency. And um, the next page, uh, 01001722, you say Hanoi's Trojan horse method of controlling uh, the communist revolution. Can you um, tell us what you meant with that? Um, the Vietnamese had uh, two principal, principal uh, instruments at the beginning of the insurgency of 1970 against the government of Lon Nol <clears throat> and the Vietnamese military forces attacks on the government of Lon Nol. They ha the, v the Vietnamese had two principal um, instruments for controlling the insurgency. Um, one was liaison committees which were set up between the Vietnamese communists and the Cambodian communists, which were these liaison committees were controlled by the uh, Vietnamese. Uh, and secondly, they had the, what were called the Khmer Viet Minh. Uh, the Cambodians who had retreated from Cambodia in 1954 at the signing of the peace agreement between France and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Those Cambodians who retreated back to North Vietnam in 1954 were reinfiltrated back into Cambodia from 1970 onwards. And Hanoi believed that these Hanoi trained Cambodian communists would be an instrument for Vietnam to control the Communist Party of Cambodia. Thank you. Um, on page 01001723 of your book, um, you, 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 you say, um, and I quote you, the blatancy of Hanoi's desire to control the Cambodian insurgency. Uh, what, what did you mean when you wrote the blatancy of Hanoi's desire to control the Cambodian insurgency? Well, I mean, uh, the, the two methods that I've just referred to, the liaison committees and the Khmer Viet Minh, as they were called, the Hanoi-trained Cambodian communists, <clears throat> made it very clear that uh, Hanoi wanted to control the insurgency. Um, thank you. Um, in um, your book on page English ERN 1734 uh, you, you, you say the following. Um, in the aftermath of the uh, independent victory of the Khmer Rouge in 1975, which had bestowed international 
legitimacy upon the new Cambodian uh, regime, Hanoi was forced to wait and try other methods, end of quote. What did you mean um, that Hanoi was forced to wait and try other methods? I think that the, that the uh, Vietnamese communists um, felt that the fact that the Khmer Rouge had come to power um, before the Vietnamese communists, two weeks before the Vietnamese communists, meant that the Vietnamese communists could not um, claim to, uh, or actually in effect, uh, secure a communist victory in Cambodia. It had been secured despite uh, the Vietnamese communists' uh, ambitions. Uh, and that, therefore, uh, the situation would have to wait uh, until uh, a Vietnamese, I believe, uh, anticipated that their agents of influence, the Khmer Viet Minh, so to speak, and those Cambodians who had some relationship with Vietnam, um, would be able to uh, assert themselves and a friendly policy towards uh, Vietnam. Um, but um, I think that the Vietnamese underestimated the extent to which Pol Pot had eliminated the Khmer Viet Minh. Uh, that is a point that I will definitely follow up upon uh, a bit later. Um, but let me um, move back to the words uh, other methods. Uh, in your book, you do not, uh, I believe, describe um, attempts to remove uh, Pol Pot uh, through assassination attempts. Um, but who does is Nayan Chanda. And let me read to you what he says. Uh, in his book E3 slash 2376, uh, English ERN uh, 0019266, uh, French 00236977, and Khmer 00191395969. Um, let me just take one f excerpt. He says, at least one of the many assassination plots against Pol Pot uh, recounted in DK's Black Book was confirmed by a Khmer Rouge defector. Um, after fleeing to Thailand, he told US officials of a plot in mid-76 to kill Pol Pot by poisoning his food. And then he goes on to describe why the attempt failed. President, please hold on. The floor is given to Judge McLaurange. Oui, merci. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I think there's a problem. It seems to me the black book, and I'm talking about the sources here, uh, comes from confessions obtained at S21, and as we have already had the opportunity to say, uh, since these confessions were obtained under torture, they are uh, not admissible in this chamber. Um, that's actually a very interesting observation because that's a subject that I will be um, discussing with the experts soon. The, the implication of what you're saying, uh, Judge Levin, is that whatever DK has ever said publicly um, about assassination attempts or coup d'etats only comes from um, confessions um, obtained in S21. I will soon be discussing uh, Nguyen Chia and Nguyen Chia's um, position toward Vietnam. Couldn't it be true that Nguyen Chia had an extremely well um, informed intelligence position? That's just one remark. However, I'm not referring to the black book. I'm referring to Chanda, who says uh, one of the many assassination plots against uh, Pol Pot recounted in the black book 
Maître Copé. Council Copé. Rather than citing Nayanchanda, who is a secondary source, could you cite the Black Book? And we will see indeed what is the source that the Black Book is referring to for such statements. Because to cite sources which are citing other sources has no point. Um, that doesn't make any sense what you're saying, uh, Judge Lefebvre. I'm referring not to the Black Book. Uh, uh, je vous en prie, Maître Copé. Ou... Please, Council Copé, refrain from making this type of comment. I certainly will not. Um, Mr. Morris, I'm not referring to the Black Book, to be very clear. I'm referring to um, a, a K.R. Khmer Rouge defector who recounted uh, as an, an assassination plot towards U.S. officials. Nothing about the Black Book. Do you uh, know, do you have knowledge uh, as to um, the existence of assassination plots of Pol Pot? Um, no, I do not have knowledge of assassination plots against Pol Pot. Uh, the sources that I was using did not refer to them, so I don't know whether they were true or false. Mr. President, I just have one comment on this report of a defector. As we know, the Khmer Rouge publicized after arrests and executions their supposed reasons for arresting and executing people. And the defector, I don't know this, because, but it doesn't say here whether the defector had personal knowledge or was just repeating what he had heard from Khmer Rouge announcements as to why Chakri was arrested and executed. So I think it is possible, but I don't know, that the source of this defector's statement is simply an S-21 confession under torture. How would that be possible if he was in Thailand talking to you as officials? Um, thank you. I'm happy to explain again. As I stated, the DK publicized to its cadres these confessions. We know this. Q Pan would read confessions, and others would to cadre. So that's how they would know uh, that the Khmer Rouge was alleging that there was a plot to assassinate, and that's why Chakri was arrested and executed. Um, whatever, Mr. Prosecutor. Uh, let me move on, um, Mr. Morris, um, to uh, what is arguably uh, uh, the most uh, important method of implementing um, Vietnam's ambitions, and that is uh, the assistance in orchestrating uh, coup d'etats. Um, because of time, um, we, we don't, we, we, it's not possible to discuss um, all attempts of, of coup d'etats. We believe there are at least three, um, 76, 77, and also 78. Let me discuss with you um, the 1978 uh, um, military coup, uh, political coup. Let me first ask an open question. Um, what is it that you know of any involvement of um, the Politburo of the Vietnamese Communist Parties in staging um, a coup d'etat in DK? I'm sorry, I, I don't know anything about the role of the uh, Communist Party of Vietnam Politburo in staging attempted coup d'etats in, in Cambodia. Um, there's two ways I would like to uh, approach this with you. Um, Let me start with the first way, and that is um, referring to um, a, a mid-February 1978 um, Politburo meeting. Uh, I have noticed that um, if that meeting took place, you do not refer to it in your book. Is that correct? 
Uh, yes, uh, I think that's correct. Um, do you recall Nayan Chanda um, and also um, William Dyker and also Philip Short referring to the existence of a mid-February um, Politburo meeting discussing very important issues? Mid-February 1978? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I only have a very vague memory of that, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure where that led in terms of what I was trying to find out. Um, to, uh, to be honest, yes, I, I, I don't have very concrete memories of that. Um, let me, let me um, start then by not referring to this mid-February uh, meeting of which Nayan Chandra gave um, details as to exactly where in Ho Chi Minh City it took place, etc. Let me move back a bit um, um, to the period before and let me read to you what Chandra said about uh, when um, Vietnam first started to uh, make preparations for uh, a coup d'etat. I'll be referring to his book, um, English ERN 00192381, and that is in French 00237064, and in Khmer 00191529. Here he says the following. A later official Vietnamese account reveals that preparations for the most important coup uh, attempt against the Pol Pot regime began in November 1977. Um, let me also quote um, what apparently um, a Soviet diplomat told uh, a colleague of his from India, that is um, Chanda 00192383 and a French 00237065 and 66 and Khmer 00191. Hello, my dear. I like Ian. Casa, please repeat the Ian number. Uh, yes, Khmer uh, Ian zero zero one nine and French zero zero two three seven zero six He says the following: the Soviets were also kept informed of Vietnamese moves against the Pol Pot regime. In November 1977, a Soviet diplomat in Hanoi confided to an Indian colleague that an anti-Pol Pot resistance um, was in the making. It consisted of a group of 10 to 15 central level leaders, at least three of whom were old members of the Vietnamese-led ICP. Um, these preparations, which uh, uh, presumably already started at least in November 77, is that something that you uh, came across during your research in the Soviet archives? I came across the. Mr. Expert, please to on, and Chancellor Burns, you have the floor. Just uh, for the record, uh, Council Kope, could you please tell us if by chance uh, you have the names of the Vietnamese officials which Nayan Chanda is referring to, the name of the Soviet diplomat as well as the Indian diplomat who apparently had this conversation so which Naya Chanda is echoing. 
Now, that is a very interesting question, Judge Laverne. That's one of the reasons why we would like to have Nayan Chanda testify here in court. Um, I'm not sure as a journalist he would reveal his sources. But can you just answer the question? Can you give the names or can't you? And if you can't, tell us why. <laughs> because Nayan Chanda doesn't uh, disclose his sources. Um, he does um, actually um, refer in, this, in the first um, footnote to uh, something called the Campuchia Dossier. This is a French um, book uh, that he refers to quite often. Um, but that's not on the case file, so I'm not liberty to, uh, to, uh, to refer to this. And who the Indian diplomat was and the Soviet diplomat, I don't know. So, um, Mr. Morris, um, have you encountered in your, in your research in the Soviet archives any similar um, things? Uh, what I encountered was um, evidence of uh, attempted uh, insurgency, but not uh, necessarily of a coup d'etat. The concept of a coup d'etat was not something that I came across uh, in, my, um, in my research. Again, that's not to say that such things did not occur. I can only say what I saw, what I read, uh, and I did not read about uh, c attempted coup d'etats. I did read about attempted insurgencies against the government of Democratic Cambodia. Um, well, I'm not sure if, if, if you're correct, and that's also the reason why I gave you um, the excerpt from um, your dissertation yesterday, uh, and I, I hope you had a chance uh, to have a look at this. Let me repeat the English year and again, uh, Mr. President, 0133519. Uh, this is what you wrote in your dissertation. According to a major from the National Army of Democratic Kampuchea, who had defected to Thailand in September, Heng Samrin had attempted a coup against the government in Phnom Penh the previous April. However, the second in command of Heng Samrin's 4th Division, based at Kampung Cham, warned the government and the plot was crushed. So it, it, it seems that you do speak about uh, a coup. Uh, your previous question had asked me, did I find evidence in Soviet archives of a coup? in my reading of the Soviet archives. And my answer to that is, as I stated, no, I didn't find evidence in Soviet archives. Uh, the evidence you cited is from my dissertation is not from Soviet archives. I, I apologize. Uh, that's uh, absolutely correct. Um, before I move to the mid-February 78 Politburo meeting, let me just follow up a bit on um, this excerpt. Uh, are you in a position to tell us uh, who the major was that affected to Thailand who said that Heng Samrin had attempted a coup against the government in Phnom Penh the previous April? Uh, no, I'm not in a position to tell you simply because I do not know. I reported everything that came in an AFP report uh, 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 from uh, Hong Kong in December of 1978. Um, but I, I, I think I revealed everything that was in the report of substance. Uh, I, I do not have any knowledge of who the major was. Um, maybe it's because of us, but we weren't able to, to locate this um, AFP report. Um, one question. Um, you referred to um, the previous April. Now, is that April 78 or is that the April in 77? Um, I think it was April 1978. Th that would make... Uh, that, would, that would make sense. That would make sense. Um, and final question, uh, the second in command um, of Heng Samrin's 4th Division, do you know whether he was mentioned 
by name in um, the underlying source. I doubt that he was mentioned by name because I think I would have uh, I would have reported his name in the in the dissertation. Mr. President, this might be a good moment to break. Thank you, Councillor. It is now time for a short break. The chamber will break now and resume at 10:30 to continue our proceedings. Court officer, please assist the expert at the back room, reserved for experts and witnesses, and invite him back into the courtroom at 10:30. The court is.